lysine lets you link things. So lysine has like an extra amino group, which allows it to form like shift bases and isopeptide bonds. Don't worry, we'll get into that. But basically, it allows you to modify proteins, such as adding ubiquitin tags or methylation or acetylation. This can do things like regulate the expression of genes through epigenetics, as well as tag proteins for degradation. It can also serve key enzymatic roles, such as helping amino um, transferases remove the amino groups from other amino acids to safely remove their nitrogen. So lysine has all these special powers, as well as it's typically positively charged, so we need to talk about that too. So move over, Kellogg's, lysine is the real special K. So this is lysine. If you look at lysine, a couple things might stick out at you. One is that it has a positive charge. Typically, we'll get into this. And another is that it has seems to have like an extra end in its middle. What I mean by this in more formal terms is that it has a pr second primary amino group. And so all these amino acids have, the reason why they get that name amino acid is they have an amino group and a carboxylic acid group. Although um, typically as we'll, um, as you'll see, or as talk about more in other posts, these are typically going to be in their um, ionic state. So this nitrogen, this amino group is going to be protonated and this carboxylic acid group is going to be decarboxylated, or sorry, it's going to be deprotonated to form a carboxylate group. Um, but we can also draw them by the way, and as we'll talk about whether giving and taking a proton, so acting as an acid or a base, this is going to depend on the pH. But in our body's pH, is typically going to be, so this is going to be positively charged, and this is going to be negatively charged. But in any case, whether or not this is fully protonated or only partly protonated, this amino group is a primary amino group. And what do I mean by a primary amino group? Well, first, what do I mean by amino group? An amino group is just where you have a nitrogen attached to hydrogen, um, to nitrogens um, attached to hydrogens and then attached to carbon or carbons. And so depending on how many carbons it's attached to, we give it different names. And so in a primary amino group, it's only attached to a single carbon. And in a secondary, it would be attached to two, a tertiary attached to three. In the case of proteins, when they link up, they use their, they have a primary amino group at their end um, that was making them an amino acid. And that a primary group was also making it so that they could um, bond to other amino acids through peptide bonds. Now, when they form that peptide bond, now instead of a primary amino group, now you have what we call this amide, um, this amide bonds, you don't have a primary amino group anymore. You only have that primary amino group on the ends. This is for most amino acids. Now, the same type of reaction happens when you have a lysine, so we put in the lysine the same way. But now with lysine in its R group, in this unique part, this side chain, you have a second amino group. And we call this the epsilon amino group. So this is the alpha amino group because it's attached to this alpha carbon. And so we call this alpha carbon, the carbon that's attached to the side chain and it's attached to this carbonyl carbon and to this nitrogen. This is basically where all the action is happening at this alpha carbon, but in, or at least the backbone action. But when you go down the chain, you can then use the Greek um, letter alphabet. So beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. And so this nitrogen is going to be attached to the epsilon carbon. So we call this an epsilon amino group. So this is the alpha amino group because it's attached to the alpha carbon. And this is the epsilon amino group because it's attached to that epsilon carbon. So lysine, it has an extra amino group in its side chain, an extra primary amino group. And so this is going to react in similar ways to how we see that this can react. And so it's going to be able to act as a nucleophile. We'll get into more of what this means, but it's going to be able to form bonds. So it can even form bonds that are like a peptide bond, but from the end of a lysine. So you can get this like isopeptide bond. This is going to allow it to say link up to um, ubiquitin to target proteins for degradation. Um, and this forms through this like isopeptide bond formation. So it's kind of like the end of the lysine is acting like the end of a protein. Um, lysine can also form a kind of bond called a shift base where you get a double bond between a nitrogen and a carbon. What's cool about this is it's kind of swappable. Um, and so you can swap it out for other shift bases. 
as we'll see, this comes into play when we deal with metabolism and we, when we talk about like breaking down different amino acids and we can kind of swap between different amino acids. Um, we can swap the amino group off when we're trying to kind of pass it from one thing to another in order to safely break down amino acids without having toxic nitrogen products build up. This also comes into play in the lab when we can use it for things like using cross-linking with formaldehyde or other um, cross-linking compounds to do things like chip seek to basically permanently link a protein or at least mostly permanently link a protein um, to a like semi-permanently link a protein to like DNA or RNA and then see where it's bound. Um, cool things like this. We'll also take a look at how lysine is going to get mod that so that amino group is going to be able to get modified. Um, and so, for example, it can get acetylated. So have this acetyl group linked on from acetyl CoA. Um, and this is going to affect, this is comes into play a lot with like epigenetics. So epi over or above, um, above the genome. And so basically your DNA is going to be coiled up um, around proteins called histones. And those histone proteins have a lot of lysines and those lysines can get modified and those modifications can affect how the DNA, when and how the DNA is used. And so when different genes are like expressed or basically when proteins are made from different regions of DNA, um, you can have modifications to these lysines that kind of loosen up or tighten up those, tighten up the winding of the, of the chromatin of this like wound up DNA um, to kind of change the accessibility of the region. And so all of this is happening because this epsilon amino group can act as a nucleophile. And so a nucleophile, we talked a lot more about nucleophilicity in yesterday's post about cysteine. So if you want to review, um, go there. But basically a nucleophile is something that has more electrons than they can comfortably handle. And in order to kind of get help handling them, they'll attack something that wants electrons. So they'll attack an electrophile. And this can have the effect of either forming a new covalent bond or if they basically, or they can kind of like a stack and seal a proton. Um, and in that case, they're just deprotonating something. And so they're acting as a base. Um, they're kind of getting a proton. So that's going to be protonation, but you're not actually like forming a new covalent bond between like a, to a carbon. Um, you're just kind of forming a covalent bond to a hydrogen, which isn't quite as exciting because you can't basically, you're not linking together molecules. It's kind of like a dead end if you steal a hydrogen. But anyway, Lysine does typically steal a hydrogen, um, and when it steals the hydrogen, well, now it's actually not that great of a nucleophile. So its ability to act as a nucleophile is going to be how we're going to get it to do all these reactions, like linking things, um, linking things together. But in order to actually act as a nucleophile, that lysine needs to be deprotonated. And so now we need to address that charge issue because normally this lysine is going to be fully protonated. It's going to be in this positively charged state we're here. You don't have a nucleophile. Remember a nucleophile? This is going to be typically like negative or partly negative. And an electrophile is going to be the thing that's going to be positive or partly positive. So if we want this to react, we're going to need to deprotonate it. We need to remove that hydrogen and remove that hydrogen. So then what we're left with is we have this lone pair of electrons that's going to be highly electronegative. And so this is going to seek out and attack an electrophile. So this is what we want to get. But in our bodies, most of the time, this lysine isn't just going around attacking things willy-nilly because typically it's going to be in this protonated state. Now, in this protonated state, what is going to happen, why this protonated state typically forms is because lysine has a pKa of about 10.5. Now, much more on acids and bases and other posts so basically the pH is a measure of the free proton availability. And so the lower the pH, the more acidic a solution is and the more protons it has. So it's kind of backward sounding, but the more protons you have, the more acidic the solution is because it's an inverse log scale. So more protons, lower pH, more acidic. Now what happened and to higher pH, fewer protons, more basic or alkaline. Now, why does this matter? I like to think of it kind of like a proton cookie jar. And so the higher the pH, you have more pro more cookies in that cookie jar. And now you imagine that you bring, you invite some cookie monsters over. And so some of the cookie monsters are going to be really greedy. And if they even if there's not very many cookies in the jar, they're going to steal one. 
and this would be like a strong base. It's going to be able to steal a proton even if there aren't that many there. Whereas if you have a cookie monster that's more generous, maybe it even comes with a cookie. So it donates a cookie. It's going to act as an acid. An acid is something that donates a proton. And so your friend is going to donate a proton, but now it's going to be its conjugate base. So it gave up a cookie, so now it might want to take a cookie. But it wasn't it's not that greedy for the cookies. And so only if the jar is really, really full is it going to take a cookie. Um, and so this would be like a stronger acid. And so a weaker base is going to basically not, um, a weaker base, so a stronger acid is going to be a weak base and a weak base is going, and a strong base is going to be a weak acid because they're kind of flip sides of the same coin. We call this the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. Now, whether or not they're likely to give a, proton if they have one um, or take one if they don't. Basically, this is going to be dependent on a value or it's going to be um, reported as a value called the pKa. And the pKa is the pH at which half of it will be protonated. And so that you can think of it as being how full the jar needs to be in order for them to take a cookie or to give a cookie. And so if something has a high pKa, this is going to be a strong base. So basically, remember that the pKa is the pH at which half of it is going to be protonated and half is going to be deprotonated. If you're above the pKa, well, now there's fewer protons available and it's going to be less likely, even less likely to be protonated because there's fewer around to bump into and bind to. And if you're below the pKa, well, you're more likely to be protonated because there's more protons for you to bump into. And so even if you don't like the protons that much, even if you're not that strong of a base, um, there's going to be so many that you keep bumping into them and you keep binding. And so if you were to take a snapshot, you would have a lot of it bound. So above the pKa, you're less like less than half of it is going to be protonated. Below the pKa, more than half of it's going to be protonated. And the pKa is a measure of the pH at which that happens. And so if you have to get a higher pH in order for that to happen, so if that jar has to be even lower for that to happen, then that's going to be, most of the time, you're going to be in that, you're going to have a weaker, you're going to have a stronger base. And so most of the time, if your pH is going to be well below that value, then you're going to have your thing be protonated most of the time. And this is the case with lysine. It has a pKa of around 10.5. Now, in our bodies, the pH is going to be around 7.4-ish. So if we go from 7.4, okay, so now we're going to go up three pH units. And pH is that, that's in pKa, these are going to be in log 10. So if we go up three units, well, now we see only one in a thousand is going to actually be deprotonated. So that doesn't seem like you would have enough to do things, right? Well, it's, an, it's enough to do things, especially because you have the environment where in an enzyme, so in one of these proteins that is going to help these reactions happen, these proteins are going to have like special pockets and the pH of those pockets can kind of be, can kind of be different. And so it can kind of have a different environment that's going to affect how reactive the lysine is and how protonated or deprotonated it is. So it's kind of like, the pH is a measure of like the total environment. And if you were to try to do like a political poll or something, not even political, but if you were to go from like house to house to do a poll, you would get a different result if you were to go test like the entire um, the entire city as if, than if you were to just do like your little block. And so you might get a skewed representation in your block and you can get a skewed kind of pH in various pockets of an enzyme. Um, and this can influence the protonation state of a lysine. So if you say have something negatively charged in your pie, maybe it's able to actually pull off a protein and make it so that this lysine is going to be deprotonated and more reactive. Bottom line, your body has ways to make it so that this lysine can be really reactive. Um, and it also, but normally most of the time, it's not, it's going to be in this protonated state. It's not that this protonated state is boring. In fact, this protonated state can actually do these things form salt bridges or ionic bonds. So basically an ionic bond is a charge-charge attraction. And so it's not like a full covalent bond. It's not like these bonds. It's not actual sharing of electrons, but it's a strong attraction between something that's fully charged, positively charged, so cationic, and something that's fully negatively charged, like anionic. Um, and so this can happen between lysine and between like glutamate or aspartate. So you can get these kind of stronger, stronger attractions form between regions of a protein, when you have these charge-based attractions. But the really cool stuff happens when you actually form those permanent covalent linkages, or at least um, 
temporary covalent linkages um, with lysine. Um, and this happens when you're in that deprotonated state. And that deprotonated state is now going to be a strong nucleophile. So let's talk more about how it can act as a nucleophile and some of the different ways that it acts as a nucleophile in our body. So a key one that I mentioned before is going to be affecting like epigenetics. Um, so basically, it's going to be affecting how the proteins, how the DNA in our in our bodies is going to be regulated. So DNA, this is where all our genetic instructions are held in our genome. So basically our genome is a collection of a lot of big um, strands of, well, 23 pairs of these like strands of DNA. And the strands of DNA have all these instructions. It's kind of like a cookbook. And then each of these strands is, these are double stranded and they kind of like coil up. You have so, so much DNA that it has to get coiled up really, really tightly in order to stuff it into all of our cells. And in order to do all that um, tight coiling, it, co it wraps up around these proteins called histones to form what we call chromatin. So chromatin is when you have like this DNA and it's kind of like coiled up around these histones. And this is really great for compacting it, but it's not so great if you want to actually access it and you need to access it in order to like do things like read it and make proteins from it. And so in order to actually do that, you need to open it up but you need to open it up in a controlled manner where basically you need to know, okay, I want to go to this place in the DNA and this huge coiled up thing. I need to realize which part I want to go to. I need to shift around those histones there so I can actually access it. And then I need to make a messenger RNA copy of it. So in transcription and then make protein from it. So translation. So all this various stuff has to happen, but your cells have to be able to find where to go and then be able to actually access that DNA. So we need to be able to modify this histone in order to kind of tell the machinery where to go and allow it to access that DNA. How this is often done is with epigenetic modifications. So modifications often to those proteins in the histo those histone proteins, they have these like tails and these tails have a lot of lysines. DNA is going to be negatively charged and lysine is positively charged. So you can kind of have it so that this lysine is going to kind of help compact the DNA and keep it closely, um, closely held together. Now, if you remove that positive charge, such as if you form, um, if you acetylate it, well, now what's going to happen is you get make it neutral, which is going to loosen it up. So acetylation like acts as the charge and so transcription factors can gain access. So transcription factors, those are what's gonna be influencing the transcription, so the making of the messenger RNA. And if you loosen up the histones, they can gain access. Another modification is methylation. Now methylation, you can add methyl groups onto the nitrogen, but you're, you're actually not going to be changing the charge of the nitrogen. Uh, you're not going to be changing the charge, so you're still charged. So methylation maintains the charge, um, and it's going to allow it so that you can still keep that chromatin compacted, but you can add regulatory marks. Um, and the effects are going to vary based on where it, bind, where it occurs and what binds it, etc. cetera. Um, but this is kind of just like, in broad terms, acetylation tends to make things so that they're more accessible, um, opener regions of the DNA to be like transcribed, whereas methylation can kind of like silence genes. But it's not it's not that simple, and you can get this methylation happening and this acetylation happening on different lysines in different positions and different histones, and it gets really really complicated. Uh, but that is one way that you can modify lysine in order to modify um, modify proteins. In this case, to modify how the DNA is being used. This acetylation is often happening from acetyl-CoA. And so here's coming into play that sulfur we talked about. Um, so how we talked about sulfur being really cool in yesterday's post on cysteine, how you can kind of form reversible links to sulfur. Um, and so sulfur is this um, acetyl-CoA group. This is an acetyl group. And so when you attach it to CoA, um, CoA has this thioester linkage. And basically you can think of this as being able to swap off this part easily. And you can swap it off onto other nucleophiles. And so in this case, we can have the lysine attack the acetyl-CoA, this carbonyl carbon, um, and then you get this tetrahydrol intermediate. Uh, basically you get this acetyl group transferred onto lysine to give you acetyl lysine. And then that can impact how the protein is, how the DNA is used. You can also use lysine to link up to ubiquitin. Um, and so ubiquitin is this little protein that serves as a kind of flag for a protein to get degraded. 
So our cells have this thing called the ubiquitin proteasome system, and I've talked much more about this in other posts. But basically, it's like a protein shredder, this machine called the proteasome, this basically this big protein complex. And it takes proteins and it chops them up and so you can use their pieces for things. Um, in this pathway, the reason how it knows what to chop up is because the proteins get ubiquitinated, the ones to get degraded. And so they have this protein called ubiquitin added on. And it, this ubiquitin gets added on through an isopeptide bond. So one of those bonds I mentioned at the beginning that looks kind of like the bonds that we see in the backbone of the peptide, but in this case, it's being to the end of the lysine. So those were examples of lysine kind of just like getting modified. Um, and, but there are also ways that lysine can get modified temporarily to act in an enzymatic, um, to help enzymes do their work. One thing that's involved in is actually moving an amino group onto another molecule so that amino group can then be safely discarded. And so we see this in the breakdown of a lot of different amino acids is we have this thing called transamination. So trans, you're moving things from one thing to another thing, amination for moving this amino group. What happens is that in the transaminase, you have a lysine, and it, what it's going to do is it's going to use this cofactor. So it's going to use this helper molecule, PLP, which is derived from a vitamin, um, this pyridoxal phosphate. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to form a shift base. And a shift base, remember, is where you have a carbon double bonded to a nitrogen. Um, and then bound to another carbon. So you have something like this. So it's going to form a shift base to this PLP. Now the shift base is going to be kind of like swappable out. So you can make swap one shift base for another shift base. And the reason why this is kind of like swappable is basically this carbon, this nitrogen is going to be more electronegative than this carbon. And you have a double bond. So basically this, this nitrogen is going to be pulling really hard on this carbon's electrons, which is going to make this electrophilic. And so it's going to be vulnerable to attack by a nucleophile. And if we have a nucleophile, um, such as the nitrogen of an amino group, this can then attack this carbon and break this shift base and form a new shift base to that other nitrogen. And so this is what's going to happen between the amino group of your free amino acid and the PLP that is temporarily held attached to this lysine. So the lysine is sticking off in this enzyme's active site. Um, and so this lysine is going to allow this transaminase enzyme to form a bond to this PLP. And then that bond is going to be shift, <laughs> that shift, <laughs> shift, <laughs> shifted kind of um, to a different molecule through a sh different shift base. Um, so basically you're going to have it so that now it's not attached to that lysine anymore. It's attached to this PLP. And then it can get hydrolyzed. So hydrolysis, the breaking lysis with water, hydro. So water is going to break this up. It's going to break this up so you get an alpha keto acid. So basically this is our amino acid, but without that amino part. And that amino part, well, where is it? Well, now it's on, it's stuck. It's stuck to this, P, um, to this, the P, PLP. Well, not, but now it's not PLP. It's PMP, it's peroxide pyridox amine phosphate because it has that amine group. So basically we've transferred that amine group to this cofactor. So that's great that we got it off of this amino acid, but now we need to get this amine group to a way that we can actually get rid of it or at least use it for something else. And so that we can regenerate this PLP. So we're gonna move that amino group onto alpha ketoglutarate, and this is going to give us glutamate. Um, and then we have this PLP regenerated. And that glutamate can be used to do other things, um, or it can be used, um, it can be kind of in oxidative deamination. You have it where you can kind of take that amino group off of glutamate as ammonia um, and kind of remove it in this controlled manner. And so this is going to allow you to take the amino group from anything and either get rid of it safely or convert it into something that you can use. And all of that is being helped out by lysine. There are different transaminases. So in one of the posts, my alanine post, I talked about the glucose alanine cycle. And so we had alanine transaminase, which is a crucial transaminase that's involved with this thing called the glucose alanine cycle, which I talk about in my post on alanine. But basically it allows your muscles to give their waste to the liver and the liver to give back um, to convert that waste safely and give the muscles back energy. Um, and it does this with by passing the amino group safely from one thing to another using this ALT.
And so your liver, say, has to have a lot of ALT. So what happens is that if you have liver damage, that ALT can kind of leak out. And so doctors often measure ALT to get an idea about how healthy your liver may be. So that's just a fun medical note. So also our bodies use lysine to link things, but we can also use lysine to link things in the lab. So we can either just like link them to what they're nearby using some sort of cross-link um, form forming agent um, cross-linker. So like something like formaldehyde or something um, more sophisticated, like a hetero bifunctional molecule where you have two things on either end and then they attack different lysines on different things or lysine on one thing and then like a DNA or RNA base. Basically, you can use cross-linkers to connect things and taking advantage of lysine's ability to form linkages. And so you can just connect them to what's nearby in order to see, let's say, what proteins are interacting with other proteins or where on DNA or RNA, the um, where our DNA or RNA uh, protein is bound. So you might have heard of chip seek, so chromatin, histone, amino precipitation. Um, and basically what happens is that these proteins, um, these histone proteins are going to have a lot of lysine. So you can cross-link them to the DNA they're bound to. And then you can kind of use antibodies that recognize different histone modifications, say, um, and immunoprecipitate or kind of like pull out those histones, um, the regions of the DNA that were bound to those histones and sequence them and see where the different modifications were, um, as well as other types of amino pre of precipitation that based on cross-linking through the DNA, um, you can use different mass spectrometry compatible um, cross-linkers. I talk about cross-linking a lot more in other posts, but basically because lysine can form these linkages with these cross-linkers and those cross-linkers can form linkages with other lysines, you can get different regions of proteins or different proteins connected if they're close by. And this makes it helpful for figuring out what's interacting with what inside of like cells or inside of mixtures, um, cellular mixtures. But you can also use lysine's ability to link things in a more artificial way um, by introducing things we want to lyse, we want to link lysine to, um, such as maybe if we want to attach a fluorescent molecule so we can track a protein. Um, so sometimes, or we want to hook a lysine up onto, say, a chip um, or some sort of flat surface so that we can work with it. And so lysine can be used in order to in order to make these kind of like non-specific um, linkages so you don't have to make any sort of modification to the protein as long as it has lysines on its surface um, but you might get like a heterologous mixture basically if you have a lot of different lysines you can have linkages at different places um, which may be a problem may not be a problem um, but speaking of being on the surface lysine likes to be on the surface because it's got the negative charge um, water really likes to hang out with it it's very hydrophilic um, and so you often find lysines on the surface of proteins where they're very happy um, being in their negatively charged state. You can also find it in the active sites of enzymes where they can make it easier to deprotonate. And once it's deprotonated, it can act as a strong nucleophile and it can form these covalent bonds um, and these temporary ones, such as when we see with groups getting passed off from one thing to another. Um, we can also see lysines get modified in ways like attaching ubiquitin or attaching methylation or acetylation that might change the properties of various proteins and how those proteins interact with other things. So lysine, it lets you link things um, and it's got an abbreviation K. L was taken by leucine um, and K was the closest, so nothing too exciting there. Um, but yeah, so lysine, K. Um, okay. <laughs>